listen only mode. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's session. We're really excited to have you with us today. Um, we've got some great content lined up for you. We're going to be talking about creating robust Cisco Meraki network. Um, we've got Dirk Delo on the line from the Avenues World School. Dirk, you there? I am here. Awesome, awesome. So my name is Emily. I'm a product marketing manager here at Cisco. Here's the agenda for today. We're going to do a brief introduction to Meraki, to cloud networking, why y'all might want to consider it, and then we're going to launch pretty quickly into the meat of the presentation today. That's the case study, talking about Avenues, the world's school. We've got um, a bunch of slides there. I'm going to try to move through those as quickly as possible because I'd love to spend a significant amount of time doing a live demo. Dirk has great graciously offered um, to allow us to demo his network, so we're going to actually take a look at his production network, and then we'll wrap up um, with sort of some, a uh, little bit of an overview of the product line, a little bit more uh, Q&A if there's time. So that reminds me, my good friend and colleague Kat is here. She's on the line today. She is here to answer any and all questions you may have. So if you do have questions during the session, please type them in the Q&A box in your GoToMeeting uh, control panel. She's there. She'll be collecting those. And she's going to be uh, fielding the most commonly asked questions um, and parlaying those to me so that I can uh, answer those for the audience. So we are hopefully uh, expecting a bunch of audience participation in terms of questions uh, throughout the session. So we'll be doing little breaks uh, and checking on those and uh, fielding those for me and for Dirk throughout the, the session. Now before we start, a little housekeeping. I am excited to announce that we have free access points for the qualified IT professionals on the call today. They are 11N access points. We'll throw in a three-year cloud management license as well, so they will be fully operational. Uh, it's yours to keep and use as you choose. All of the wireless functionality that we demo today will be available to you uh, in this free demo. So. Um, if you have any questions about eligibility, just check out the URL at the bottom of your screen there. That's meraki.cisco.com slash freeap. And to get your access point to you, we do need you to call and confirm your shipping information. So check your inbox, check your spam folders. There should be a reminder email about today's webinar session. And in that email will be the contact information for your Cisco Meraki rep. And that's who you want to call. So we can ship you your free access point. OK. So a little bit of introduction for those of you who may not be as familiar with us. Uh, Cisco Meraki, uh, we used to be Meraki, that was a company that was founded in 2006 by a research team from MIT. And at MIT, they were working on a project called the RoofNet project. It was called that because they were literally climbing on top of apartment building rooftops in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They were affixing wireless access points to them, trying to figure out how to manage them from the internet. And the foundational technology from that project is, is basically what we used to start uh, Meraki, the company. And uh, Cisco took note. Uh, we were growing rapidly. We had spanned out into four product lines, so not just wireless access points anymore, but uh, we were making switches, security appliances. We have 100% free mobile device management as well for iOS, Androids, Macs, and PCs. And Cisco took note, said this looks like a good thing. We're going to buy it. So they bought us in late 2012. And since then, we have just been on our, our incredible, uh, incredible, incredible growth trajectory. So we are one of the fastest growing BUs at Cisco, seeing uh, over 100% year over year annual growth. Um, we've been, like I said, operating in the cloud since uh, 2006. And uh, you know, we've been recognized several times over for innovation by the uh, IT media and analysts uh, that are out there, folks like Gartner, InfoWorld, et cetera, et cetera. So we've also been recognized by some of your colleagues in the K-12 campus space. So this is 
not a comprehensive list, but just to sort of give you all a sort of overview of the, the kinds of institutions that we service in the K-12 space, um, we actually have a presence in just about any market vertical you could think of. I mean, everything from construction, manufacturing, to professional services, to retail, to K-12, higher education, some financial, some healthcare. Um, so you, you do see us uh, pretty much everywhere, and we are also found in organizations of various sizes. So, uh, you know, we're not just a mid-market solution. We can grow and shrink uh, with your needs. It's one of the benefits of being cloud-based. Um, so some folks might just have, uh, you know, uh, one uh, security appliance or a couple switches or some, some wireless, uh, you know, all the way up to organizations that have on the order of tens of thousands of uh, Cisco Meraki equipment. So, obviously begs the question, why would you even want to consider cloud networking? What, what's the deal there? Um, well, we believe a couple things. Uh, fundamentally, we think cloud networking is the future. This is where the market's moving. Uh, and the reason for that is because the cloud increases IT efficiency. It offers you benefits that you just don't have with a traditional uh, sort of on-premise architectured solution. And the bucket areas around um, some key benefits are things like manageability, scalability, cost savings, what you see right there on your screen. Now, in terms of manageability, what you're going to see when we get to the demo, and you'll, you'll probably hear Dirk talk about it, is the, um, the incredible visibility, end-to-end -end visibility and control that you have over every single piece of Cisco Meraki equipment. Uh, so, you know, you can drill down, see everywhere in the world that your networks uh, are deployed, drill down in any network, drill down in any piece of Cisco Meraki equipment, even drill down into client devices that are passing traffic through that equipment and get useful statistics and indications about bandwidth consumption, application consumption, apply policies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, part of the benefit as well to us of being cloud-based is uh, you can actually pre-configure all of your Cisco Meraki equipment before it's ever been plugged into power, plugged into the internet. Uh, once you do plug in, you can then uh, it will then grab its configuration settings from the cloud and run with that. So very easy to manage and deploy remote sites. Uh, and then we have features like seamless updates. So every quarter we push out seamless firmware and new feature updates to your Meraki equipment, um, to the dashboard, which is the web-based console that you use to manage the equipment. Uh, and very, very easy. There's no manual uh, downloading or staging of equipment uh, or manual patching that you ever have to do for Meraki gear. Uh, in terms of scalability, I think we, we kind of touched on that, but uh, the cloud is infinitely scalable, so we can grow and shrink with your needs. You're not going to have, uh, what would I say, like the traditional limits uh, that you would see, so things like uh, device limits, uh, needing to buy a wireless LAN controller or redundant controllers in any way. You don't have to do any of that. Um, we've pushed all of that out to the cloud for you. So literally you're just buying the edge equipment that, you know, the AP for your classroom, the switch for your switch closet, uh, and then you're managing everything from the dashboard. And so that actually translates into some pretty significant cost savings. You are going to find that you don't need to buy that redundant controller. You're not going to need to buy additional controllers when you hit device limits. Uh, you're also not going to need to spend a lot of money on training for your IT staff because we are very intuitive and easy to use. We've got a graphical user interface, so no tricky command lines uh, that you need to worry about. And you might find that you're saving money too on travel because we are so phenomenal for managing remote distributed sites that you might find you don't actually need to travel or be on site very often uh, to service or fiddle with your Meraki equipment. So keep those themes in mind as we go through and uh, when we get to the demo. And just to kind of highlight once more, so we have four product lines, wireless access points, MX security appliances, so those are UTM, Unified Threat Management Boxes. We have uh, uh, Ethernet switches, so access and aggregation layer switches, and we have 100% free, no strings attached free, 
mobile device management for iOS, Androids, Macs, and PCs. And every single product that we make is designed to be 100% cloud managed. So from anywhere in the world you have internet, from any internet accessible device, you can log in to a browser, go to dashboard.meraki.com, log in, view, and manage all of your equipment. Uh, so we did want to just provide a high-level schematic for anyone uh, who's not familiar with with cloud and, and how the sort of how the cloud networking architecture here works. Um, like I said, the Meraki equipment will sit on premise at your location. So whether it's a wireless access point, a switch, a security appliance, it's going to sit in your schools, in your administrative offices, on your campuses, in your stadiums, uh, but it will initiate a secure connection back to our cloud. And by cloud, I mean our data centers that are located all over the world. Uh, it is a secure connection. It's encrypted twice, once with proprietary encryption and then again with SSL. And it's a very small connection. It only averages about one kilobit per second per device. Um, and you can see that here on this graph. Uh, that's because we use an out-of-band control plane. And what I mean by that is we're not seeing or storing end-user data. You know, wherever that was intended to go, it goes. That's basically what that red line that's uh, denoted as WAN indicates. The information that we're collecting is simply the management and monitoring statistics we need to present the information that you're going to see in the dashboard. So things like the number and type of client devices, the applications that are being used and access, the websites that are being used, um, bandwidth, et cetera, et cetera. So again, no end user data is ever seen or stored in our cloud. Now, there are some benefits, built-in benefits that we've alluded to of this cloud managed architecture, and we, t we did talk about scalability. I do want to just pivot a little and talk about the reliability and the security of this architecture. So uh, our data centers are SSAE 16, I think that's formerly SAS 70 certified. They undergo daily penetration testing by McAfee. Uh, we ourselves are PCI level one compliant. We have customers that have built PCI and HIPAA compliant networks using our gear. We've got uh, high availability built right into the backend architecture. So in the event of catastrophic data center failure, you know you flip over to a secondary data center immediately. There's maybe a slight blip in service, but your network won't. Uh, won't be down uh, for any significant amount of time and we actually do have a uh, high service level agreement with our data centers so 99.99 percent uptime SLA agreements there uh, and we try to be as open and transparent as possible uh, about our architecture about our data centers about our privacy policies and everything else and we post all of that information on our website so I would encourage you if you have questions either ask them here or check out meraki.cisco.com slash trust there's a wealth of information up there about uh, our architecture and, and how we how we lock down everything so definitely check that out all right so that, that sort of wraps up the brief intro to, to Cisco Meraki and cloud networking. And what I want to do is actually now get to the meat of the presentation with Dirk. Dirk, here you are. We've got a great photo of you. If you don't mind just um, introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about your role at Avenues, that would be fantastic. Certainly. And thank you for the introduction. And uh, my name is Dirk DeLow. I'm the Chief Technology Officer with Avenues the World School. We opened our doors in September of 2012 uh, to a new campus in Chelsea, New York, and we are expanding to about 20 campuses around the world with our next campus starting in Beijing. So uh, the idea of basing our infrastructure in the cloud was, was really in the genesis of when we started our network design. So you know, my job has been here to really come up with technologies that integrate well so we can spend our time focusing on technology integration rather than spending our time and resources and money on just IT functions. Great. Great. Actually, and speaking of IT, I was just curious, how large of an IT team do you have if you're expanding out to 20 campuses and whatnot? Right now, our IT team is fairly small. We've got a, a total of 12 people in our department. That includes our library and technology, and next year we have about 1,300 students. Uh, so our, our library team 
team is about uh, is, is, is three, our technology integration team is five, and our IT team is four. Okay. So uh, we have a, a fairly fairly small department when it comes to the actual IT support, and most of that support is dedicated to keeping the 2,500 mobile devices up and running and repaired because, as most of you know who work in schools, uh, even if you have a, a large mobile fleet of devices, uh, screens still get broken and uh, things get dropped, and uh, there's a little few repairs that need to go on here and there. Mm -hmm. For sure. So we have a great slide here uh, sort, of, sort of highlighting um, some of the fantastic, uh, I would just say, features of your school. It looks like you guys are making headlines. And I was going through the slides earlier today for, and, and noticing I've never seen or heard of a school that is so technically, um, you know, with, where technology is sort of embedded so much in, in every possible process. Um, can you just maybe talk a little bit more about the school and, and sort of set the stage for the folks on the call? Certainly. It's, it's a global school, and a couple things really kind of distinguish uh, avenues as a school is that we have a language immersion program. So our students in our nursery school, starting in nursery school and through our lower school, spend half their day in either a Spanish immersion or Mandarin immersion and half their day in an English immersion. The idea is we really want to graduate uh, students who are fluent uh, and truly fluent in the second language by the time they enter our middle school, which is our fifth grade. As okay. part of that, we really want to personalized learning with technology. We have a one-to-one -one program that starts in the kindergarten with iPads uh, and matures into what we call our one plus one program where we have iPads and MacBook Airs in the hands of every student and faculty in the middle and upper school student. And all, all faculty and all staff uh, throughout the school are what we call one plus one faculty and staff. So all of our professional development, as soon as a faculty member joins Avenues, uh, and they receive their iPad and MacBook Air. Everything they receive is delivered to them onto the iPad via an iTunes U course for professional development. So there's no big binders. Everything is digital because we want our teachers to really understand this is the delivery method that we want you to use with our students. So we have no textbooks in the school. We, we uh, incorporate a variety of learning management systems and content distribution systems to be able to uh, really develop a, our curriculum, which is a new curriculum. Uh, to be able to distribute to all of our students. Great. So normally around this time I ask folks, you know, what was your legacy architecture like? What were the problems and the networking challenges you were facing? But it sounds like you guys are very, very new uh, and you were already looking at sort of cloud-based solutions. What, um, you know, were there any, are there any particular networking challenges or, or uh, sort of deal breaker functionality that you needed from uh, solutions when you were going out and trying to figure out which vendor you were going to use? Well, when we were starting up the school, um, I, I inherited a legacy uh, network solution um, that was at our headquarters function, which is kind of our office. And the first thing I noticed as I started to hook up devices was that we couldn't use AirPlay technology. Mm. Uh, and AirPlay technology for our teachers is just really revolutionary, the idea that any teacher or student at any given time can project wirelessly uh, into any of our rooms was really kind of key to coming up with a student-centric learning model. So immediately one of the knockout criteria for network selection is we needed to have a system which was robust enough uh, and didn't have the interference that we could support the bonjour networking that was required to prioritize and manage a large installation of airplay. Uh, mm -hmm. At the time, in talking to some Apple engineers, they, they said, well, we don't know of an installation, you know, this was back in 2012, that you know, had 70 you know, to 100 airplay devices running in a single building. Um, and you know they weren't sure how you'd be able to design a network or do the bandwidth. So one of the things we wanted to do is make sure we could come up with a system that had the type of visibility that we could see this because we were not just piloting this. We were we were going in, uh, you know, with 77 classrooms, and we wanted to make sure everything worked on day one. Mm -hmm. uh, and considering we got in the building um, about 10 days before the opening of school. Uh, because of construction delays, it was it was one of those uh, kind of scenes where you just wanted everything to work, and, uh, and it did. Great, great. Um, so just kind of moving through the slides again. Um, so student-centered classroom, you're talking about the one plus one initiative, digital textbooks. Uh, we did get a question from the audience, which was, uh, you're using a lot of Mac, it looks like, and Apple products, but are, do you allow BYOD? Are there any Androids or other devices? Uh, yes, we, we, we are all uh, Apple for our students. We, uh, we do have a couple of PCs on campus for our, our security systems. 
um, but we do support uh, students bringing their own devices, uh, you know, smartphones, mm -hmm. uh, BOA Idea devices. Uh, we have a large parent population that comes on campus every day. So one of the nice features that we enjoy about the, the Meraki system is being able to create you know, a guest SSID and be able to garden wall them out to the internet, limit the bandwidth and their accessibility, not mm -hmm. allow them to airplay on our network, um, but be able to have that availability throughout the building. Um, and we also happen to be, in New York City, there's a lot of interference that you get from adjoining networks. So some of the rogue network detection feature, we can actually keep our, 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 our air, our wireless air pretty clear from the adjoining wireless networks uh, so that, you know, students aren't, aren't bombarded with a whole, you know, with 30 or so SSIDs popping up on their computers. We're able to kind of contain a lot of that using some of the management features that are built into Meraki. Great. That's actually a great segue into sort of what you were looking for, the needs that you have. And speaking to reliable Wi-Fi, we have another question for you from the audience, which is, could you speak about your access point density? So I'm guessing they want to know, uh, you know, maybe what model APs you're using and perhaps how many clients you're seeing per AP. Uh, we can actually look at some of that in uh, when we get to the live demo. But to answer the question, we Given the number of devices that we have, uh, we have average about 18 students in the class, and then each can have two devices plus the faculty. So the density we decided on was to go with the, uh, the uh, MR24 is uh, one per classroom. And then mm -hmm. depending on the common room spaces, some, uh, some have multiple ones in some of the larger common room spaces uh, to be able to accommodate you know, several hundred devices in the common room space at once. So, you know, on, on, on an average day, I just looked at our statistics on our dashboard today. We're not up to 3,000 devices today because uh, we have some summer camps on campus and they are not quite as intensive users as the students are when they're in the session. But, uh, you know, on a typical day, we can see about 2,400 of our school-owned devices on the network and anywhere from a few hundred to even a thousand uh, guest devices on our network as well. Mm -hmm. uh, People might not be familiar with uh, New York City, but there's this park called the Highline Park, which is an elevated train platform that's been converted into a park, and it's a walking park. And uh, people pick up our guest SSID out there, and they're redirected to our homepage so they can find out more about us when they join our Wi-Fi uh, using kind of the guest SSID access. So, uh, you know, some days we'll see, you know, you know, 1,000 or 2,000 devices even just connecting on our guest network from the, uh, to find out more about the school from the Highline. Wow. Wow. Um, and it seems uh, going through, you know, obviously wireless, um, looks like you have some switches, looks like you have an MX or two, or you're using that for uh, various things. But um, I do, and I'll go through and, and demo this a little bit later, but could you speak a little bit about the content filtering for SIPA compliance? Um, that's always something that a lot of folks are curious about and how that works and um, what your experience has been there. Certainly. Um, you know, we have, uh, as an independent school, we have, uh, you know, we don't accept the federal funding, so our, our SIPA requirements isn't there, but we do obviously do some filtering because we have, you know, students under 13, so we do a lot of content filtering for, for inappropriate materials of, of students who be in a, a nursery through 12th grade school. Uh, but one of the things that we don't do is we don't block uh, social media sites, uh, social networking sites. It's actually one of the things that we want to do is encourage our students to develop an appropriate use and a responsible use. So we have a responsible use policy that we work with the students to work with that. But that doesn't mean that we don't use Meraki a lot to monitor who's really being responsible about the use. Uh, a mm -hmm. case in point is uh, the first week that we opened, uh, we noticed that there was just a lot of BitTorrent activity. And we were quickly able to send out what I like to call little no love notes uh, to those particular users who were using an inappropriate amount of BitTorrent uh, activity and, and one of the things that we're doing in conjunction is we didn't block BitTorrent, we just limited it to uh, about 56K, uh, <laughs> which <laughs> meant that they could still connect to the servers, they weren't looking too many uh, ways around it, but it was a, a great way to kind of slow down literally, um, you know, students being able to use, uh, you know, inappropriate access at times. Great. Um, so there are more questions coming in uh, from the audience, and I think they're actually looking like they're good transitions to uh, this slide right after this one. So let me just sort of uh, recap for folks on the line here, thinking about the Meraki solution, some of the benefits we talked about in the intro, and I think Dirk is highlighting here, uh, the ability to sort of centrally manage multiple locations from anywhere in the world. You have internet access, very easy to get your sites up and running. 
um, high performance access points for wireless and guest networking and um, some of the things we haven't touched on is you know you can integrate with Active Directory um, you can of course push out policies like Dirk was just alluding to throttle and shape traffic um, based on application or application type um, so uh, I think some of the questions are sort of getting at the meat of how you've deployed your network. So one question was if you could speak more about the network security that you've deployed, specifically are you using WPA pre-shared keys, um, are you integrating with a, an authentication server for wireless, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, to answer the immediate question, we are using the, uh, the WPA uh, pre-shared keys. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have them as part of the image uh, and part of the profile of each one of our iOS devices so that uh, people automatically connect to our respective secure Wi-Fi network if they have a, a school-owned device. Uh, and then we do permit, um, although this year we might change that policy in, in the BYOD environment, we might restrict BYOD devices just to the guest network, but that's a, a, an ongoing discussion right now. But the nice thing is we have the flexibility to be able to do what we need on the fly. Uh, mm -hmm. A good example is um, you know, when we're hosting a conference, uh, and we have a lot of guests on campus, it it's just it takes me a couple of clicks to uh, create a new SSID just for that particular conference. Uh, you know, the Apple Tech Update, all of a sudden, you know, the entire floor was lit up with an Apple Tech Update uh, SSID with its own policies where they weren't as restrictive as a guest network and they can immediately airplay on our network without having to give out, you know, our WPA keys or things of that nature. So uh, it was very easy to do and then simply turn it off after the conference was over. So. Uh, having that flexibility and configuration is really nice as far as, you know, setting up the wireless access points and policies. Once we got the policies up and, and running uh, out of the box, it took much more time to physically mount uh, the wireless access points than it did to configure or manage them. Mm -hmm. So it, it was nice because now that we're, we're using some of our access points for telecommuting, uh, we can literally take something that shows up in a box. Uh, add it to the dashboard, have it clone the policies uh, that's already in a group, and the person goes home and plugs it in, and they've got full access in a site-to-site in -site VPN to be able to take care of something like that. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. All right. So uh, we use the, um, just to go back on the slide, sorry about that, but uh, no the MX uh, security appliances, we use them at all of our sites. And one of the things that we really like is the site-to-site -site VPN, which, you know, really out of the box, you could just talk to each one of the MX boxes, tell them to trust each other, and next thing you know, you, you have a site-to-site a -site VPN where resources that are on our headquarters, on our campus, or even in some of our remote locations in Beijing, um, all of a sudden our, our colleagues in Beijing can access a lot of the Google resources and things which are blocked by the, the Chinese firewall. Mm -hmm. So the deployment and configuration is, is literally easy enough that you can send these off to be plug and play for, for people who might want to be able to connect to your network remotely. Yeah, and I, I don't know if you've had a chance to, um, to check our blog today, but we're actually just announcing a slew of new features for our MX security appliances, um, sort of tangentially related to what you're talking about. One of that is the ability now to have geo-based uh, IP firewall rules. So if you want to limit traffic to uh, only be within specific country borders or prevent traffic or allow traffic from particular countries, you can do that uh, now as well. So That's some great. Exciting, yeah, I some know exciting there's some, some, some wishes that went into the dashboard wish list <laughs> that seem to have gotten incorporated in this release. So I was very yes, happy to see that yes. wishes do come true. They do. They do. Um, I'll actually have to show folks that when we demo where they, where they can go and make a wish. Um, yes. It does work. <laughs> uh, so we've we've actually been talking and, and touching on quite a lot of of some of the points here on these slides. Um, I think uh, mobile device management. You, you guys are you using Systems Manager or using? Yes. Uh, okay. So we've been using Meraki Systems Manager uh, for mobile device management, and one of the things that we transport uh, trans. Uh, makes it, that's the right word I'm looking for. We, we uh, migrated to, I should say, is with the new Apple deployment policy with the, uh, with the DEP policy and the transition mm -hmm. from the VPP. I was happy to see because that, we knew something was in the works, but the, the great thing is, is once that came out and Apple released it, uh, all of a sudden on the Meraki systems manager, there was a beta version of how you can actually use this. So 
all the new mobile device management solutions, it was nice to see that Meraki had a, a good seat at the table and was able to implement those features. So we were able to start testing immediately this spring when those releases came out uh, to be able to see how we're going to do with the migration models as far as now managing apps uh, on all of our iPads. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually did our fourth grade rollout uh, this June uh, using it, you know, putting some local caching servers and, and using the, the DEP and uh, on the systems manager MDM solution. And um, I have to say it went very well. I mean, we only might, you know, we only rolled out about 60 devices, but, you know, when you're rolling them out to fourth graders, if it works well with 60 fourth graders, uh, that's usually a pretty good, uh, pretty good <laughs> indication. That is true. Um, and that, that's actually a good segue. I know we've been talking about some of the benefits of cloud architecture, but uh, perhaps I didn't highlight it enough. One of the really cool ones is is the the fact that we are constantly updating our products. So it's it's almost like an organic thing. The piece of Meraki equipment that you purchased today is is not going to be as feature rich as what you own three years from now because we will have updated it so often and so frequently. It, about every quarter, in fact, all of our product lines undergo uh, some some update. It usually has new features incorporated with firmware updates and uh, all access to updates and, and technical support and access to the dashboard is included in sort of an all-you-can-eat comprehensive license. So we try to make things as simple as possible. Uh, Dirk, we are getting a few more questions from the audience for you. Uh, one is, um, do you have VLANs and are you using any other vendors other than Meraki or are you a full Meraki shop at this point? Uh, I'll start with the question of VLANs. We had a, an interesting challenge in our building in that we're 10 floors, uh, and this is a building that was built in 1928 uh, that had solid concrete and steel between each floor. And as those of you who are in older buildings know, that wireless does not travel well uh, between floors in that environment. So in order to manage our uh, the bonjour and airplay resources, we did create a different SSID for every floor in the building. So that way people would know when they're on a particular floor, if they want the best performance, they should be on the floor. Uh, their SSID should be selected to the floor that they're on because mm -hmm. with the SSSIDs, they still kind of bleed through the floors. So if you're on the sixth floor, you can usually see the seventh and eighth and uh, fifth and fourth floor, but mm -hmm. obviously you're going to get the best performance. So we've used uh, Meraki to basically break down a VLAN for every floor. And we've also have created several private VLANs and, and secure VLANs for security systems, for our digital signage systems, uh, and a few other systems, and also for our network management systems. Uh, at the time when we um, built the school, we, we have about 1,500 Ethernet drops in the, in the building. Uh, Meraki did not have really a high density solution uh, for kind of the chassis, uh, for, for um, you know, the, the edge switches, so we went with another provider for the, for the edge switches just in that one deployment, but we still use Meraki for the wireless and the security appliances. But at our headquarters and moving forward, I think we should be able to be in an all Meraki uh, configuration. Great. Uh, and then there are a couple questions. It looks like um, I can actually take a few of these. One was, will turning on content filtering decrease MX performance? Um, the answer is yes, there will be some load on the SMX security appliance to implement content filtering. We actually just ran a bunch of tests in Cisco's fancy lab down in San Jose, and we've documented the results of those tests in a new MX sizing guide. If you just search for MX sizing guide in our document library, you should find it. Um, that has the latest and greatest updates on how much of a hit performance-wise uh, turning on different features would be for individual MX models. And uh, one person wanted to clarify setting up the automatic site-to-site -site VPN is you, you need two MX security appliances, yes, for the for the auto VPN, setting that up in like three clicks. Um, we do support site-to-site -site IPsec VPN with third-party non-Meraki peers. Uh, it will take a few more steps. Still pretty easy, though, um, to get set up. And uh, do the MXs support client VPN? Yes, they do. You can use L2TP IPsec client VPN. It's sort of built into most modern day uh, operating systems at this point. And we do use that. Uh, we use our MX. Uh, it is really only the only security or the only appliance we have in line. At my former school, we had 
a different appliance for packet shaping, a different pack, uh, a different appliance for uh, intrusion prevention, a uh, different appliance for content filtering, a different mm -hmm. appliance for link aggregation. Uh, and it was nice to just have everything in, in one appliance now with a simple dashboard where you can manage it all and you get the transparency and the benefit of being able to, you know, with the reporting features, be able to see into what's really going on on your network as, as you'll see in, in shortly. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the last question I'll, I'll field um, before we wrap this up and then move on to the demo. Uh, someone was asking how many SSIDs can be uh, supported per access point and the answer to that question is 15. Um, so, so Dirk, before we go on and, and demo your network, is there anything else you want to highlight or uh, any, any other thing that you would want folks to know if they're considering Meraki? Um, let us know now or we'll, we'll I, I would on. say, well, you're going to see an example right now is, as you pull up the dashboard, um, the funny stories that I have is, you know, even uh, showing Meraki to some, uh, some technology colleagues of mine, you know, at a bar in New York City, I was able to just open up my iPad and pull up the dashboard and they were just like, you can see all that from here, you know, <laughs> and it's just the ease of being able to manage a network. Um, we had a, you know, I'm sure you heard about uh, Superstorm Sandy come through New York. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I was uh, unfortunately or fortunately on vacation at the time and was able to basically do all of the remote network management, um, you know, from where I had power and data, uh, where my colleagues back in New York, where they had no power and data, they didn't have visibility into the, the cloud controllers and things of that nature. And we actually were able to use really that cloud controlling technology to tell when we got power back to certain floors of the building and things of that nature because the alerts were set up set up to tell us when uh, when some of these devices started coming back online so uh, you know the the nice thing is is, is in that even in that type of you know um, environment where everything is is kind of falling apart around you it's nice to know that your your infrastructure is actually in the cloud where you can still see it know when it comes back up and be able mm -hmm. to reconfigure it to be able to to do what you need to do when the power comes back online definitely definitely um, Fantastic. I, well, I think um, the, I guess the last slide is actually the future of technology. So, uh, uh, if you just want to really quickly give a quick blurb on where you're headed, um, it looks like you're opening up more campuses all over the world. Uh, you, know, you still got that lean IT staff. I think you said 12 people, but maybe four were, in particular, IT folks. Uh, still going to go with Meraki? Yeah, or? exactly. We're still going to go with Meraki. Uh, you know, we've already spoken to Meraki Cisco about getting the equipment in China. Uh, we have uh, some of our APs running in China right now. Uh, our headquarter office is going to be an all Meraki office that's uh, set up this fall, mm -hmm. uh, including the site-to-site -site VPN, which. Um, is actually works through the Great Firewall of China. The only hitch is you have to share your encryption keys with the Chinese government just so they can keep in when they want to. Uh, but as long as you're compliant with that, it's okay. Um, so it's it's nice to see that it, it's flexible and it's it's scalable, and we can really you know open up our network so that when we want to add a, a network in Beijing, which when you go into our our, um, our systems manager, you'll see we actually do have a Beijing network already up and running, although the everybody back here in the United States and they, they turn things off when they leave because power is very expensive there. Uh, so <laughs> it might not be online uh, because I was just meeting with them this morning. But it's nice to have the flexibility that, you know, I can, you know, if we have a new hire that's going to China, I can just put an access point in their bag when they go back and when they plug it back in, you know, they, they have access to all the resources as if they were right on our headquarter campus here. That's awesome. That's fantastic. Uh, well, thank you. Let's let's actually get into the demo. I think that's probably what folks are really curious about. So let me switch over to uh, my web browser here. I'm gonna have to sign in again. It's a security measure, so bear with me. Oops, I have a uh, particularly long password. So give me one second. No, this is not on an iPad where people see what it is. <laughs> I know. All right. <clears throat> so let's sign in, and then I'm just gonna get you, Dirk, to confirm that I. We did get the right network, so we don't demo someone else's network, but <laughs> I think in a second once we log in. And I apologize if there's a little bit of sluggishness or flakiness. Um, I'm in the marketing section here in our San Francisco office, and we're frequently the guinea pigs of the wireless test engineers, so it's always a little fun. Uh, but I think we're up. Dirk, is this you? 
uh, that looks like us. All right, uh, fantastic. I recognize all the various networks. Um, Great. If you want to talk so, about the wireless net networks first, we'll probably see the most activity on the New York City wireless sixth floor. Sixth okay. floor is where our tech office is. Great. Uh, I'll keep and also we have some camp there. activity there. Awesome. So yeah, so um, so for the folks who are, are have never seen the dashboard, what we just did was we logged in uh, to it with our dashboard credentials and we've, we've got this great overview already of where in the world Dirk has Meraki equipment and networks deployed and right away we're getting uh, some indications of status, things are green, you know, I could dive into any one of those little icons and then roll over them and, and get a more drilled down view of my equipment um, or, or expand out here. Uh, you know, sort by usage or sort by number of clients, and you were saying it was the uh, Wireless 6 network, right? Wireless 6 network probably has okay, the next so we'll dive in there. activity. Looks like we had a firmware update. Oh, good. You see the little red bars in our, our wireless? Mm-hmm. So there was some downtime here in the last week, but mostly online, mostly good. Uh, and if we dive in, oh good, you guys have got floor plan views, so that's excellent. Um, so what we're looking at is uh, Dirk's wireless, New York City wireless sixth network. Um, he has uploaded floor plans and, and placed his APs on the map, so right away you can see that the APs in a various various floors of his building are, uh, are online, they're healthy, the, the numbers are indicating the current connected clients, and you could dive into any single one of these access points uh, and drill down into it to get a more granular view of that access point, get a sense for what kind of access point it is, which wireless networks it's broadcasting, so you've got three right now. Um, you get a little bit of information down in this live tool section that has built-in tools in our dashboard to troubleshoot and diagnose uh, perhaps issues with the AP if necessary, but right away you can see you've got 24 clients connected. Here they actually are in real time. You can sort a usage, um, get some information about your channel utilization perhaps, neighboring access points, the uptime for this particular access point. Again, you'd see some red or a sliver if there had been a reboot or some downtime and then some troubleshooting tools I think anyone in network admin would be familiar with. And where this gets powerful is, you know, you could back out. There's many ways in the dashboard to jump around and see uh, the same or different information. You know, you could come in this way, check out your access points, and see all of them that are deployed for this particular wireless network and drill down into any single one of these. Uh, a really great feature as well, probably the favorite page of our clients, and this is a page that's not just limited to our access points. Uh, it's available if you have a security appliance or a switch as well, so you would get this level of visibility, but it's the clients page. This is actually going to show you for a given network, uh, for a given time frame, I'm going to select a week, how many client devices connected to your network, what kind of client devices they were, uh, what kinds of applications they were consuming. So, you know, right away we can see you almost had 500 unique devices connecting to this particular network. I'm actually going to pull up a little bit more information um, for my favorite part of this demo when I demo this page. What's really cool is we have a uh, Google-like contextual search. So right away, you know, if you're in a BYOD environment or you want to get some more uh, details about who's connecting, you can do searches like, okay, well, how many of those 491 devices were iPads? Or how many of them were Windows machines? Or do we have any legacy operating systems that might pose a security risk that we're worried about? Things like that. You can drill down, dive in, do searches based on the description of the device, the operating system, manufacturer, uh, IP address, MAC address, username if you're integrating with a, an authentication server. And uh, we call that client device fingerprinting. There's nothing that you need to install on the client side to get this level of visibility. It's just built into our gear. And similarly, uh, we do application fingerprinting as well. And you can sort by usage. And so right away, for a given week, we can see what are the top applications that are being consumed. Um, you know, for example, here we've got iTunes, and if we wanted to click into the iTunes application, uh, we can get a little bit more information about it, maybe a link to get uh, more details, and then see who, which devices were the top consumers of this application. So um, there is a, f uh, a switch you can flip in Dashboard as well if you want more granular 
details where you can actually see the specific destinations and or active time spent per client for each of these applications and that would show up here um, but some people choose to to keep that off uh, for privacy or other reasons so I'm not going to demo that for you. a feature a feature we use a lot at the school uh, people mm -hmm. have the tendency to misplace their iPads Mm -hmm. So when we do find them connected and online, or at least we can find their last location, if you uh, click on Albert or Chad or either one of those at the top, those are uh, two guys on my team, it should actually pinpoint uh, if you change the map to the sixth floor, uh, it should actually show where it is yep. located uh, on the floor. There you so go. when you're actually looking for devices, uh, you can actually pinpoint like where the device is. This looks like the iPad is out in the common room and probably sitting on the on the bookshelf right there so you know if somebody's missing a device uh, you can actually tell you, you can it triangulates pretty well if you put in your floor plans and you put in the access points in the mm -hmm. in the correct location of the floor plans it does a really good job of triangulating the only problem is is when you're working in three dimensions it's very possible this could be on the floor above or the floor below uh, and right. still connected to the sixth floor network so it doesn't work in three dimensions yet I did add that to the wish list but uh, it hasn't popped up yet. <laughs> it's in the queue. It's in the queue. Um, but I'm glad you had me drill down into this this particular iPad because this is a uh, the visibility into client devices that come with all of our uh, gear and all of our equipment. You know, you can see in real time. Yes, he's connected wireless. Here's his real-time signal strength. Um, you know, we could come in here, get some more information about this particular device's application usage for a given time frame, and we can come in and actually apply policies to it straight from here if we wanted to apply uh, device by device policies. So blocking this device, applying a group policy to it, possibly even applying a group policy based on SSID, um, all these sorts of things. We can run an integrated packet capture on the device as well. So a lot of great visibility drilling down. Um, you know, what you can do as well uh, you know, you don't necessarily have to drill down into an individual device to configure a group policy. I know Dirk was saying earlier there was a BitTorrent issue. Um, what you can do is actually create group policies that apply out to various devices or groups of devices or groups of users, and it's very, very easy to do. You literally just come in. Um, you can even schedule when you want the device to be live and active and applied. Um, but you come in and you just say, for example, I'd like to perhaps block an entire category of traffic. Maybe I want to block BitTorrent. Um, I could do that here. Or, like Dirk was saying before, if you don't want to outright block an application, you could prioritize it or throttle it in some way. So maybe you could come in here and say something like, well, Hulu and Google Video and maybe Netflix are causing me some grief, so I'm just going to throttle that down to... Uh, will be a little bit more generous. We'll say 100 kilobits per second, not 56. Uh, or if we wanted to prioritize these applications, instead you just make sure that you ignore any limits. And it's literally as easy as that. You go out and you apply the group policies, and that's how you, you take control of your network. Um, is there any particular uh, wireless feature you would want to highlight before we move on to the security appliance and the... Uh, the switch no, I was going to say, we, we generally do the packet shaping at the security appliance level, but you, you could obviously do it at the, at the, uh, at the wireless level as well. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the feature that I like is um, you know, being able to configure the SSIDs, SSIDs on the fly, uh, yep. being able to locate devices uh, on your network and drill down and see the individual usage on them. Yep. So, like I said uh, earlier, you do support up to 15 unique SSIDs on an access point, and you would come into the access control page to set up all of your association and authentication requirements, any splash pages. You wanted to automatically assign policies by device type. You know, Androids get one particular policy, and uh, other types of devices get another. You don't even have to worry about who's bringing what on your network to know that it's getting a, uh, a policy. Um, so lots of great features there. So let's actually take a look at the security appliance because that has some great stuff. Do uh, you have a preference over one or the other, Dirk? Uh, NYC is more interesting. Headquarters is pretty boring. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's corporate. You know, you get a lot, much more interesting data from the school. So, uh, so let's just dive in really quickly. Um, sim I just want to show, again, all of our, our equipment has a page that was similar to what we looked at with that, that access point. 
uh, if it pops up, you'll see a uh, just sort of a status configuration page for the appliance um, telling you active ports and you get your own live tools for it. Uh, you'll also have a clients page that shows you exactly who's passing traffic through your network. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'm just going to hit the killer features of the MX that probably apply for folks listening. Um, so I do want to just show you the site to site VPN. Again, this is a unified threat management box. All MX security appliances uh, perform a various variety, I should say, uh, of uh, security and, and, and uh, such, such functionality such as VPN and you know, intrusion prevention and uh, content filtering and things like that. Uh, they're all supported on every MX. So uh, one of the things is, of course, site-to-site -site VPN in three clicks. It's very easy. You would select a split or a full tunnel VPN, decide if you want a mesh or a hub and spoke mode, uh, and then the cloud and the MX work together behind the scenes. They set up phase one, phase two, authentication and things like that. Um, we already know, in fact, which subnets are available to export over your VPN, so really all you have to do at this point is hit save, uh, go to your second MX, perform the same tools, and then right away, you're going to start to see your VPN come online. The MXs will start talking to each other. You can monitor the health and status of that VPN network uh, from the VPN status page. So very, very easy to get that set up. Um, and I think the only other thing that I'll, that I'll show here, I do just want to highlight the content filtering because that's, that's pretty fun. Um, and the Let nice one of the nice features of yeah. the, uh, the the site to site VPN filtering are, is is being able to get the real time latency uh, mm -hmm. because as you'll see our latency to Beijing is extremely high right now uh, but it's going through a, a DSL connection so we're we're working on that with uh, getting a better internet service provider but having those latency really helps you do some troubleshooting on on the site to site features as well. Mm -hmm. And you can see pretty quickly if something is offline and and not working so definitely agree with you there. Uh, so, so content filtering, um, we partner with a company called Webroot Bright Cloud. They're a market leader for cloud-based content filtering. The benefit there is that they're always keeping their content filters up to date. Um, all you have to do is come in and select from, I believe it's 70 or 75 different categories of content that you'd like to block. Um, you can, if you'd like, uh, cache the content on your MX for higher performance. So the first million URLs or two of, of each category would be cached. Uh, or you can do a full cloud lookup if you want to make sure that there is no site uh, that would possibly squeak through your content filtering. You could you could set it up that way. Uh, we also support things like um, you know, blocking encrypted search uh, or enabling safe search. So we support Google, Yahoo, and Bing if you'd like to enable that and then enable uh, encrypted search to be blocked. You could set that up here. Uh, and then we also support integration with YouTube for Schools. So if you have a YouTube for Schools ID uh, so that you can ensure YouTube content is sort of sanitized and vetted, you could input that ID there and uh, the MX will basically take care of it for you whenever you try to access YouTube or a student tries to access YouTube. So um, I think what we should probably do in the interest of time is just very, very quickly look at mobile device management. I know some folks, uh, well, there's usually a ton of people who are very interested in that. So let me just very quickly move over and, and show you guys that. Uh, essentially, again, free mobile device management for iOS, Androids, Macs, PCs. Uh, you just enroll your devices into your systems manager network. They pop up here. You can click into any single one of these devices, drill down and get a lot more granular information and control over that device than you had um, just you know, through the client visibility and tools uh, from using Cisco Meraki equipment. Uh, so you can see here you can do things like erase the device or selectively wipe it, lock it, clear its passcode. You can also do things like group the devices, teacher iPads versus student iPads, for example. Go through then and apply various security and feature restrictions based on the group. Um, so sort of things like whether or not uh, users can use the camera or access iTunes or install applications or maybe perhaps there's some security passcode complexity requirements you'd like to set up or you would like to have the devices automatically be able to enroll in your wireless network or a VPN. 
and things like that can be set up. Uh, and then, of course, you can push out applications and manage applications to those devices. So we do integrate with the uh, Apple Store and Google Marketplaces. It's as easy as literally saying, I'd like to add a new app. Um, you can search for the app, and it will be come available down here if it's in one of those stores and just hit add um, and right away you can determine who gets that application and who doesn't uh, and then uh, we'll give it to Dirk uh, and then if you needed to uh, apply any VPP codes you can do that here. That's one method of doing it. I know Dirk was talking about the Apple device enrollment program, some new functionality there that we've just enabled. So different ways of, of doing this but uh, just to give you a sense for the power of this free tool, it's right there. Okay, I know that was a whirlwind tour. Um, we, <laughs> we have like two minutes left. I think um, what we're gonna do is uh, just really quickly wrap up with the presentation uh, and, uh, and then what we'll do is, I think since it's lunchtime, I can stay on the line for maybe another two or three minutes and, and answer any questions. Dirk, if you have to go, feel free. Um, no. But I mean, uh, we'll, we'll hang on for just a little bit more, for a few more questions, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. So I think the only other thing that I'd like to, to say is if any of this looked interesting, if you, if you are curious about Meraki equipment, I highly encourage you to take advantage of our free eval program. Uh, we make every product available for free evaluation. There's no risk to you. We actually pay the shipping both ways. So there's literally no cost. Uh, you have access to our entire technical support team. And there's even a dedicated support team if you would like to get your own uh, date set up for a dashboard demo, have someone walk you through how to set up everything and, and walk you through sort of the features. So that's a little bit of an extra bonus that you would get as, the, as an evaluator that you uh, might not otherwise know about. So if you're interested, give us a call. Uh, otherwise, check out meraki.cisco.com slash eval. Okay, I'm going to just call that a wrap for the uh, for the presentative portion of this, let me uh, let me actually pop open the Q and A box here and see. Kat's been doing a great job answering a ton of questions, uh, and if you will just bear with me for one second, I'm going to see if there's anything that looks like it's been asked quite quite a bit. Uh, so someone's asking, what is the length of the eval? I believe it's two weeks, perhaps, but um, I think two everything weeks, in the yeah. world is negotiable. So <laughs> talk to your Meraki rep if you're interested. Um, someone else had a question about which devices were supported with mobile device management. So again, iOS, Androids, Macs, and PCs have significant support. You can, in fact, enable support for Chromebooks. Uh, we have limited ability to provide sort of feature restrictions and things for that. That's because this is sort of a Google operating system. Uh, operating system restrictions. So we are actually uh, talking to Google to try to be able to access more in Chromebooks to provide uh, better feature and security restrictions. But you, you can go in and, and check out what, what we do offer there. Uh, we do not support Linux at this time for mobile device management. Um, so a question I think for you, Dirk, are you using any switch routing uh, at your schools? Do you have any of the layer three switches? Uh, we do have some of the, the Meraki Layer 3 switches. Uh, we've, we're not really doing switch routing. Um, well, that's not true because every VLAN is, is on its own. We're just doing switching between the VLANs, uh, I think, is a short answer to that. Okay. Um, but to sort of maybe address something Michael might be hinting at when he asked the question, um, the Layer 3 switches, so the MS320s, and if you needed aggregation switching, the, the MS420s, they do support um, static routing and we actually announced uh, they are going to be supporting OSPF in fact. Um, we anticipate that will be ready by the end of this month so it'll be graphical OSPF. You won't have to worry about command lines or anything like that. Let's see. Uh, we Looks like we've been getting a couple questions about whether you can deploy Meraki equipment alongside non-Meraki equipment. And the answer to that is yes, we are standards-based. So uh, if you just want APs, if you just want one security appliance or a couple switches, you can do that. Uh, the, the caveat I always throw in is you always need to go to our dashboard to manage 
Meraki equipment. You cannot manage Aruba access points, for example, from the Meraki dashboard. So you would have at least more than one interface that you were logging into to manage your gear, but you can absolutely deploy us alongside others. Uh, we have a question, is there an annual smart net type maintenance agreement for Meraki devices? The answer is no. Um, so so I, I breezed through this earlier, but the way it works is when you buy Meraki equipment, there's just two SKUs. There's the SKU for the hardware and a SKU for a license. And you choose whether you want your license to be one, three, five, I think all the way up through 10 years. That license is all you can eat. It covers all the feature. Uh, features available in the dashboard for, for, for that device. It includes the technical support that you might need. It also includes all the new features and firmware updates that we push out every quarter for your device. Uh, do we support BlackBerry mobile devices? Not in the mobile device management systems manager, no. Uh, we can detect them, though. If you have, say, for example, Meraki access points, we can detect that it's a BlackBerry device. And with our wireless, you can apply group policies automatically by device types. That would be something you could apply policies directly to Blackberries if you'd like. But uh, they're not supported in the MDM. Ah, very good question, which is one we often get. What happens if your connection to the cloud goes down? What happens to your network, and can you manage your gear? So if you lose internet connectivity, your network will continue to operate with its last known configuration. So that means your wireless SSIDs will still broadcast, your firewall rules will still be in place, VLANs will still be defined. Uh, of course, you cannot get online. Uh, and you cannot get online to then go to the dashboard to manage your equipment. Um, the caveat to that, well, I should say, typically if your internet is down, you're trying to troubleshoot your internet with your service provider, you're not necessarily uh, looking to go tweak uh, VLAN settings unless you have blown yourself up inadvertently. Um, if you have done that, we do have uh, special URLs if you're directly connected to or directly downstream of Meraki equipment, you can type in a special URL in your dashboard that will give you enough functionality to those devices, things like setting IPs, VLANs, turning ports on and off, to get you back online. So if it's not your ISP that's at fault, but uh, misconfiguration, we do allow you to, to get yourself out of that. Let's see. Uh, does device triangulation require more than one access point? Yes, typically. Uh, and then there was a question, I think perhaps for you, Dirk, are you using the built-in DHCP server in the MX for DHCP we are using our built in Yeah, we're using the built-in DHCP servers in the MX at our headquarters, um, where, but we're not using the built-in DHCP on our campus. Uh, given the number of devices, we have uh, redundant DHCP uh, servers um, running uh, per VLAN. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. It looks like Kat got through most of the questions. I might just take one or two more and then call it a wrap. I will say if you've asked a question and it hasn't been answered, have no fear. We've, we're actually collecting these and they get forwarded out to your Meraki rep. So you, if you call them for the free access point uh, or they give you a call to check in on you, then uh, they should already know that you've asked this question and they should hopefully have an answer for you. Uh, so for example, if you have questions, Remy, about pricing, I would definitely talk to your Meraki rep. Uh, and then a really great one, can you set multiple management levels for different staff to control specific aspects of the access point or perhaps other things? And the answer is yes, we do support role-based access control. Um, when you create a dashboard account, you're creating an organization, and within that organization, you can create multiple different networks. You can have organizational admins and network admins. You can even drill down into port admins, so you can grant port level access to our switches, for example, uh, but you can definitely set things like read-only privileges or full privileges, uh, and then we even have some uh, special logins, like for guest ambassadors, if you just want to enable perhaps a receptionist to be able to grant uh, temporary Wi-Fi, guest Wi-Fi accounts or things like that. Um, so definitely we do support role-based access. 
All right. So uh, someone was asking about the expected lifespan or life cycle of the devices. I'm guessing that's the mean time between failure. And it's different for different models, uh, but we do publish that information in our data sheets. So I would encourage everybody to check out meraki.cisco.com slash library. Go in. We've got a bunch of white papers, data sheets. Uh, you can read to your heart's content about all the different product lines, or just check out our, our website uh, and check out the different models and the information there. Okay, we're five past the hour, so I'm going to wrap this up. Um, thank you all for your time and your your uh, your engagement. I really hope this was a great session for you, and thank you so much, Dirk, for taking the time to chat with us. It was fantastic hearing about your school. Pleasure. Yeah, um, so hope to see everybody again at a future webinar, and uh, thank you again for your time. Thank you.